Hello listeners, and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we have the story of the King of the Flowers, from W.E. Griffith's Korean Fairy Tales and Folk Tales book. This is the story of the meaning of some of the flowers in Korea, and also a moral tale for monarchs of the land. Okay, let's begin. The King of the Flowers Korea is the land of beautiful scenery and lovely flowers. Snow white and ruby red are their chief colors. In the springtime, when the ice has melted and the rivers have poured their floods into the sea, the whole country blushes with the pink bloom of azaleas. The glens are white with the lilies of the valley. The breezes, as they sweep the land, come laden with perfume. The girls mark the season of the year and the time of the month by the blossoms, even more than by the almanac, for they keep in mind the calendar of the flowers. Daughters that are especially beloved of their parents are named from the blossoms, and the Korean house father, when affectionate, speaks of his wife as the plum tree. An old song says, A homesick husband, long away from his dear ones, inquires of a fellow townsman newly arrived, Have you seen my native land? Come tell me all you know. Did just before the old home door the plum tree blossoms show? And the stranger answers promptly, They were in bloom, though pale, tis true, and sad from waiting long for you. This is like the Scotsman who calls his wife his bonny briar bush, for in the land of morning glow they have the language of flowers. Each plant and blossom has a meaning and either delightful or disagreeable associations. It is a compliment to speak of a girl as a pear blossom, for the pear is one of the most glorious of trees and its blooms are lovely to behold. It would hardly do, however, to call her a cinnamon rose, for this flower has evil associations. The gisang, as the Koreans pronounce the name of the geisha, as the Japanese call the dancing girls, are associated with the cinnamon rose. For did not the sages tell this story? Twelve centuries ago lived the renowned scholar Sul Chong, the greatest of all the learned men of Korea. His head was as full of knowledge as persimmon is of pulp, and his ideas were as numerous as the seeds in a pomegranate. He taught his countrymen all that was in the books of China, and in the temple of Confucius his portraits hang to this day. He lived in the kingdom of Shilla in the days of its glory, when ships from Japan and China sailed into its seaports, and the Arabs from Baghdad brought their pretty wares to exchange for gold, ginseng, camphor, porcelain, cinnamon, ginger, and tiger skins, to take to their renowned caliph and his turbaned nobles at court, of whom we read in the Arabian Nights. When the king of Shilla, Shin Mun, was living in luxury and filling his palace with too many pretty dancing girls, who distracted his mind from attending properly to the affairs of state, Sol Chung warned his master against the increasing influence of these women by telling him the following story. Once upon a time in spring, the peony, king of the flowers, blossomed so gorgeously that it became the admiration of all the lovers of beauty in the whole country. Hundreds of people made long journeys to the capital of Shilla to see its bright blossoms. In the king's gardens, on very tall stalks, the many branches were heavily laden with large red flowers. These were indeed lovely to behold, but the king of the whole garden was a single peony, growing on one stem, so that all the strength and nourishment of the plant were concentrated in that unique royal bloom. All saluted this flower as king. When all the other flowers heard of their king's glory, they came to pay their respects at the floral court, of which the peony was sovereign. All the trees sent their choicest blooms as envoys. In one glorious procession of perfume and color, the peach, plum, pear, apple, and persimmon trooped in, each making its obeisance to the monarch of all flowers. All these tree blossoms prided themselves on their being so useful to man as harbingers of the delicious fruits to come. Then among the bright throng appeared sprightly young virgin flowers, the tea rose, in pearl-tinted frock, 
the azalea in pink, the lily in white, the strawberry blossom, and a score of other pretty creatures of the garden. Last of all appeared the cinnamon rose. She tripped nimbly along in a green skirt and red jacket, with a haughty air and a breath of spice. One after the other they were presented to King Peony, and gracefully made their salute. But of all, the king seemed to most favor Miss Cinnamon Flower. He let the others pass out from the court, but lingered long with the spicy visitor, spending much time in her society, as if smitten with her charms. By and by he invited Miss Cinnamon Rose to come and live in the palace, and leaving his ministers to carry on the government, he spent all his time in her society. She was installed in a place near his majesty, and always seemed to have his ear and attention, even when the king's prime minister had to wait long for an audience or even a word. Miss Cinnamon Rose seemed to be the real ruler instead of the king himself. But one day there came to the palace the flower-called old man. He looked exactly like an aged beggar, dressed in sackcloth and leaning on a staff. Respectfully bowing, he asked if he might share the hospitality of the king's palace. He was welcomed and fed, partaking of the royal bounty. When at last he was given audience of King Peony and was invited to speak, he said, Out on the road, your majesty, I heard of your rich feast and good things to eat. Now I hear that you need medicine. Although you dress in Chinese silk, and none are equal to you in the magnificence of your robes and the splendor of your court, yet you are much like me in your wants and you need a common knife string as well as I. Is it not so? You are quite right, old man, replied the king. Yet I like this cinnamon rose and want her with me. I cannot do without her. Yes, your majesty. Yet is it not true that if you keep company with the wise and prudent, your reign will be long, powerful, and glorious? But if you consort with the foolish, your house will fall. Did not three dynasties of the emperors of great China fall because of the beautiful women who tempted their majesties to forget their duties? If it were so with the ancients, how much more so is it now? The king blushed, even to a deep crimson. He confessed his faults and reformed his life. It is said the lesson was not lost on the real human king. He dismissed his harem, sent away the dancing girls, and ruled wisely till the day of his death. The End Okay, so some things I did like, some things I didn't like. Um, one thing I didn't like was blaming women for the king not ruling well. If the king's distracted, that's the king's fault. But what I did like is it reminded me a bit of high school when my then-girlfriend found out about the language of flowers during the Victorian times. She taught me a lot about what flowers sent what messages. I've forgotten the meanings of all of them long, long ago, but I do want to say thank you to Ashley for trying to teach me all of that so long ago. Also on a side note, here in Korea, carnations are the flower you give to your parents on Parents' Day. So that's just a little FYI. Today's podcast shout-out is to Bewilder Beasts. Melissa does a great job of sourcing and organizing stories that have to do with human and animal interactions. The stories go around a theme and are informative, relatable, entertaining, and just a pleasure to listen to. The link is in the show notes, and if you like it as much as I do, go and give her a 5-star rating on Podchaser or iTunes. And today's listener shout-out goes to Rajasthan, India. Raja meaning king or ruler, and Stan meaning state. So it's the king's state, essentially, in India. You are home to the Great Thar Desert and the city of Jodhpur, where the riding pants get their name. I will attempt Hindi for today's language. Danyavad aur shubhar ratri. Thank you and good night.